Hello everyone and welcome to Whitetail Driven Solutions YouTube channel. We are bringing you tips, strategies, and tactics to help you and your property be more successful. We not only invite you to subscribe to our channel, but also hit the notification button to be notified when we release new videos. My personal feeling is, and what I try to educate everybody on, is to put more emphasis on the sanctuary outlook on these food plots um, than you do on your on your uh, normal sanctuary areas as far as a bedding area or whether that's a transition area or um, it's just a thick nasty piece of the farm that you don't go into. We're going to talk about why that is. Most of the time when you hear the term sanctuary this is what uh, folks are referring to. It's an area that's set aside on the farm that you don't go into you, um, if you access on the north sometimes, a lot of times it's on the su southern part of the farm, or it's somewhere deep into a, uh, an area that you don't go into, it's known uh, through your hunting club, you don't go into it. The problem with this is, is what I find on set-aside sanctuary areas is it's just that. It's a set-aside piece of the farm that's forgotten, and nobody goes into ter internal of it. What that creates is, I don't see... Um, what I what I do see is a lot of folks not going in and and maintaining that area. I don't see a lot of um, area that is um, that holds that's worthy enough of not creating and maintaining and keeping that sanctuary to its fullest potential. Potential. And what I'm saying is, is you know I go into these areas or you see these areas and that term has been used for years and years and years and that uh, you know people have been setting setting aside these sanctuaries and that's great you got to have some spots on the farm that you just obviously you know that you just don't um, you know whether that's a bedding area or whether whether it is it's just it's a piece of the piece of the puzzle that you just don't pressure and you keep that pressure off from it but like I said what ties to that is what I find is folks don't they don't go the extra mile make sure them areas are maintained. So when they label it the sanctuary, nobody goes in there, nobody does anything, nobody goes in to track deer, nobody does anything. During the summer, they're still not, they're still, you know, treating these areas as a sanctuary area. And what I highly recommend doing is in these areas is I recommend using your uh, bedding areas as your sanctuaries, but making sure that these areas are prepped, these areas have the correct uh, amount of stem count, they have the correct amount of browse, um, the density is correct, and what, where I'm going with all this is uh, probably at least half or more than half, more than half of the uh, these sanctuaries, these bedding areas that I go into, these set aside areas. What I find is I find that the the, the uh, path, the uh, direction of travel, or the uh, line of travel from these areas back to the destination feed locations are not established and set up correctly. What I find is that they're not maintained enough to funnel the line of travel to where you need it to be through that transition area where you can hunt, and that that what what happens is that takes into um, you know thought that these areas you're cutting the line of travel getting to and from the stands so in theory is is if your deer are in these uh, sanctuary areas and your line of travel isn't established and isn't correct and you don't maintain these areas they get out of control they get way too wild and they are not performing as you think they are by standing on the outside of them and creating it you know treating it as a sanctuary area there, there's certain times of the years where, where you need to pull that thought, that mindset, that thought process away from those sanctuaries, go in, make sure they're designed right, and make sure that they are what they, what they are needed to be. They need to be an area where the deer feel safe. They need to be an area where uh, they have the right stuff in there. And that leads us to the next topic. So not only are they not being maintained, what I find is, these sanctuaries, let's use an 80 acre farm for example, um, I got a gentleman that I just spoke with the other day, uh, 80 acre farm and 20 acres of it is a sanctuary, which is great if it's in the right location. 20 acres is set aside, 
that 20 acres is all left alone. I said, is you know, um, we we're talking about hunting strategies and how to, you know, looking at through an aerial before we go and uh, we'll be um, on that farm here a couple within a couple of weeks. And uh, like we were chatting about is, is that transition area, about promoting that transition area a little bit better and that site access. Well, what I found is that 20 acres is completely wild, completely out of control. There's no doe bedding versus buck bedding. Nothing has been created in there because it's a sanctuary area. So the gentleman went for a walk uh, two weeks ago and guess what? There's no beds in it. Absolutely no beds. So not only has he been treating this area as a sanctuary on his farm for three or four seasons now, and thinking that this was a sanctuary area that he was staying out of, the deer are treating it as a uh, that area that they were staying out of as well because there's nothing in there. His the it's got a lot of pine conifer. Um, he was picking up some uh, maybe late season because of the uh, thermal protection in there. It had some white pine, some low ground, you know, and but there's no food value into it. There's it's. Um, I haven't, I've hunted in the area of that 80, but I haven't been on that 80 yet, but you know, we're, this is all, you know, talk from above, you know, right now. And this is feedback that I'm getting from my client. So if you walk into it and you think that there's not the bedding area in there, I can guarantee you that when I get there, that it's not going to be up to standards, my standards, as far as what I would call a perfection or perfected bedding area. So, and he's, uh, he's already found, we were talking about that line of travel, that direction, like I was talking about is uh, the tracks that were in there had nothing to do with the way his, uh, the way it, you know, it didn't tie to the egg, it didn't tie to his food plots. So, so in other words, make a long story short, we're starting on a, on a completely uh, blank slate. So that ties into why we need to tr transition the focus from the number one idea of a, of a, of a uh, sanctuary versus what sanctuaries usually are. Like I said, I don't want people, you know, writing in and commenting and saying, that, you know, I'm, I'm saying sanctuaries aren't good. I'm saying sanctuaries as bedding areas that are created and maintained and treated properly are are good. The problem is, do not do not get into a mindset where you're you're not maintaining that area because it's, you know, you don't go in there. You don't go in there whether it's spring. You don't go in there summer. You don't go in there fall. Nobody goes in there. Your your hunt club knows not go in there. The neighbors knows not not, not to go in there. You are defeating the purpose. It has to be diverse. It has to flow. It has to be huntable. If it's not, and you're you're waiting for deer to come through a transition area, going past you on a stand location into a destination feed location to the east. So you know deer are coming from the west. It's on a west wind, and they're going to the east. Let's say, and the your line of travel is north and south. That sanctuary is doing you no good. Absolutely no good. So. You have to go in, you have to find these areas, you have to create them, you have to maintain them just as you would the rest of your farm. And you have to treat those areas as a, as a you know, stay out of, don't get too close to them in a, uh, in a rut setup. Um, that's another video, but getting too close to them, pushing the envelope and getting in, internal of these bedding areas, etc. going into the fall. That's how you need to treat a, a sanctuary. So that leads us to today's topic about a true sanctuary as far as something that's totally overlooked and there's so much focus on a bedding area sanctuary and a set aside part of the farm to, to hold these deer is what you know the, the thought process is to hold these deer but the biggest thing that I am here to promote and to tell folks and to get people to understand is your food plots need to be number one on your sanctuaries your food plots need to be number one your agricultural grounds need to be number one now, with the ag, uh, the ever-changing ag is what I'd like to, to, uh, to refer it to. Ag is a um, situation where if it's, a, if it's large enough to be considered what I consider ag as far as uh, soybean, and then, um, and then you know, transitioning into corn, or corn and soybean both on a farm, whatever that case is, when, you know, some of the crop rotations, one year it's beans, the next year it's corn. With keeping that in mind is, that agricultural ground changes so much, not only from year to year, but it changes so much from, from uh, you know, month to month that you really need to focus on what's there, what's going to be there, like we've talked in other, in other videos. You need to focus on not, not what you're hunting when you hang your stands in the summer. You need to focus on 
what your what that area is going to be in the fall. So, off topic there a little bit, but what we need to focus on is the making these under, making folks understand that your food plots and your destination feed locations need to be number one on your on your sanctuary list. After they are created, after you maintain them, such as you do your sanctuary, your bedding areas, you need to make sure that your goal this fall in the 2020 season. If you don't, if you don't take any other advice that I put on social media, or any other advice I talk to anybody ever about, please put the number one uh, emphasis on your food plots as a sanctuary. So, is your sanctuary near a road? You're going to have to do some screening. You're going to have to do some. Um, you're going to have to get some other noise factors taken care of. That's not you accessing around the food plot to get to a stand locations, stuff like that. You, get, you have to look at the Midwest as Iowa, Kansas, Illinois, these areas as a training tool on as far as uh, palatability, what to, what to plant, how to plant it. We, in the areas that are high pressure areas, such as Michigan, such as Wisconsin, Southwest Wisconsin, um, Minnesota, uh, parts of Indiana, we have to understand, we have to go to the next level folks have to get in a rhythm of treating these destination feed locations as another piece of your sanctuary puzzle, your number one piece of your sanctuary puzzle. And the reason I say that is your hunt, your, your success revolves around deer not being blown off their, off their food plots, their destination feed locations. That's, that's the number one goal that you have to be in an area, obviously, that you don't get busted between bedding and feeding, but when they get to the feed, these feed locations, and this includes bait, when they get to these feed locations, bait locations puts put the deer on edge, and their 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 anxiety goes through the roof. Everybody knows that. If you don't know that already, and you think that that's not a not an issue, you're missing the boat because there's <laughs> I've got trail cameras, I've got years of experience hunting over bait myself, being ra born and raised here in Michigan. And I'm here to tell you that the anxiety level goes through the roof. What's that cause? That causes drama. That causes drama on a feed location. What what happens when you cause drama on a feed location? It's the same the same outlook as you, and then you add to it on a bait location because it's usually put in a bait pile, not over like we've talked, you know, not over it spread over to this food plot location like it should be. But if you are hunting it, you're not only creating drama of the deer because they mature deer come in. They're used to being busted. You can do everything in the state of Michigan. You can do everything right on a bait bait station. And you can, you know, sit there for two hours until you think the deer are gone. And you can do, you know, try to do everything you can possibly do in your power. The fact of the matter is, within a 24-hour period, especially during their, their fifth, fourth, and fifth feeding of the night, your bait location is not the only bait location that these deer are hunting. So when, are, are visiting. So when you're when you're trying to do everything right and every and I'm not saying people that hunt over the bait do do are doing it wrong because there's a lot of guys out there that go the extra mile that try to do things right and that's great the problem is you're not taking into consideration what your neighbors are doing and what everybody else the majority of the hunting uh, public is doing especially on public ground um, so what that what I mean by that is these deer the anxiety goes through the roof we have to take that pressure off these food plots. We have to take the pressure off these destination uh, feed locations because if you do not have a comfortable a setting of a food plot that's taken care of and treated as a sanctuary where there's no camera flashes going off, where there's no pressure, where you're not walking in, in every day collecting trail camera cards, where you're not uh, stinking that area up where you're not driving the four-wheeler through it where you're not walking through it in the morning blowing deer off you're not walking back past it getting out of the stand Th that what this what this creates guys is it creates you have to look at the the sanctuary as a number one area on your destination feed location your third feeding of the day that huntable feeding of the day if you cannot make that huntable feed time period a comfortable transition area where deer routinely know that they're not being harmed and that's their area you're you're doing you're doing exactly what the majority of the hunting public on other pieces of the ground in your area whether that's on private or public ground you're doing exactly what they're doing and you're creating 
more drama. Well, you create that, that drama on that food plot and it, it creates a ripple effect in a backwards mo motion towards your regular sought after uh, named labeled sanctuaries you take all of you take all of your success and you put it in, re, in rewind and reverse all the way back to their to their bedding areas their sanctuaries their normal sanctuaries your sought after sanctuaries what happens is is you can have the best transition area in the world you can have the best stand location in the world you can have the most habitat improvements done on your farm but if those deer are not only being not only being bumped out of a out of a not only not having the correct habitat improvements and the right stem counts and the right feed to hold them in these normal uh, bedding areas, these sanctuaries, not all, then do you add to the fact that they're getting bumped and they're getting pressured on their feed location. <clears throat> That's exactly where the word nocturnal comes into the deer world. You totally take your huntability of a farm, your success, your hunting opportunities of a farm, and you might as well flush it in the toilet as far as I'm concerned. So now, like I said, you go to the Midwest, there's a obviously there's a lot of folks down there killing deer off food plots but and destination feed locations it's a totally different world down there but what i'm here to, to tell everybody is even in those locations it's about everybody wants to see deer everybody wants to see numbers of deer everybody wants to see deer in a in a perfect green food plot everybody wants to see these deer in their in that uh, in that food plot that you spent all this money on and I understand it. I completely understand it. The problem is, I'd rather see the right deer in front of my stand than the, the all the deer on a food plot. I don't have to see uh, I don't have to see 30 does a night. If I see a handful of does, the right does, and mature bucks, if I don't see a doe on any sit, that's you know that's fine with me because then I don't have to beat the noses of, of 30 does. I don't have to beat you know, 60 set, 60 eyes, 30 sets of eyes. I have to beat one nose, two, two, maybe two noses in that transition area from that location where they're going out to the destination feed locations. That's why you have to try to strategize. You have to design these farms. You have to use the contour, side access, not cutting this these lines of travel on, especially these small parcels. And we have to start promoting. You have to start treating these especially on small parcels if if you if you can't get away with it in the state of michigan on a large parcel you're definitely not going to get away with it on a small parcel in the state of uh, and especially in a high high pressure state such as michigan wisconsin minnesota parts of indiana and you know some states in the, on the east side here you're not you're going to accomplish what you're what you're looking to accomplish as far as being successful if you don't put the emphasis, more of the emphasis on your destination feed locations, how many times have you seen this situation happen? Uh, you, you go to the stand, you're successful, you shoot a, a buck or you shoot a doe, and uh, the deer, uh, especially with a, with a bow, runs into a sanctuary area. Well, you were told never to go in there, but you got obviously you, got to, you have to do the ethical thing, you have to go in there and, and do it. You go in there to get the deer, uh, you, you know, you pray for a rain or whatever that is to take that scent out of it. But you go in there, you get the job done, you get out, you hunt it two or three days later. Those deer transition back through where you're hunting, or that their deer are back in that transition areas or them uh, sanctuary areas. They recoup. That does not happen on a food plot. If you do those same theories on a food plot, time and time again, your your chances, especially in these states. Your chances of success go go uh, down the down the drain. All of your hard work, all of your money, all more of your money that you spend on any part of the farm usually is in your crops or in your destination feed locations. There's no other spot of the farm that you routinely put as much money into as as much you know mowing, planting, seeding, frost seeding, trimming. They're uh, planting apple trees, whatever the case is. All of this habitat improvement that we teach and preach and, and we design and we help folks set up, there's no more uh, area that, that requires more attention than a, than a food plot. The problem is you do all this work and you get to the, you get to the go time in that October, November, December time period. And usually by the end of October, 
your destination feed locations are ruined and uh, you, like I've always told everybody, you can have the best food plot in the world, you can have 30 inch brassicas, you can have the greenest, you can have the, the ideal food plot, you can have the best corn stand, you can have the greatest soybeans in the world, and if you've got pressure on those areas, you don't have anything because if, if, your, if your success is collecting um, nighttime uh, trail camera footage of mature bucks on your food plots, you're, you're, you're not, you're not uh, your huntability of the farm, your success rate is not during the times that you need it. And that all goes back to the power. And you can see that I, you know, I have a lot of feeling about this, a lot of passion about teaching this and, and hunting and teaching people how to hunt correctly on small parcels, in transition areas, off of the food plots, out of the bedding areas, and how to maintain. This is a endurance race. This is a, you have to be there at the end of the race to win in an endurance race. Five times in a 24 hour period, these deer, any deer around the country, five times in a 24 hour period, they have to eat. If you start taking their, their um, comfortable uh, times during those comfortable feedings of the day, you, stay, you start taking those out of the equation. What you're doing is you are creating, you're forcing deer to be uh, to go into hidden areas and if you don't have these hidden areas you don't have these areas that are set aside that they feel comfortable in they're going to go somewhere else it might not be today it might not be tomorrow but these deer are going to go somewhere where they are comfortable that and that in our area here that might be five miles from where you are and it happens time and time and time again our area here in lake county michigan especially where the where i live here right now is is a perfect example many many times during the year you see all these deer in the ag fields. You see all these deer on these 2040s, 80s. And every year, I'm, I'm helping folks figure out where this mature buck was, or where he's at, because he's not where he was. And time and time again, he gets killed five to seven miles, 10 miles away from where, away from where he was in uh, September and parts of October. And the reason is, is because it's all directly related to pressure on food plots so the end of the rant there but that's where i'm trying to 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 put the most emphasis that i can on treating these areas as as a sanctuary bumping up your security level on those on those uh areas on these food plots your destination feed locations and letting your hard-earned dollar promote your your property to the fullest that you've put all your heart and soul, all your money, all your hard earned money into these food plots to get you where you need to be to hold these deer throughout the season. But do do one thing is try this year is to try to take the pressure off those feed locations and watch your success. Watch the comfortable, watch them feeding start, them transition feedings, them that third feeding of the day where you need to be, that's your successful feeding of the day where you need to be there and in be you know um, on their way to that that feed location and once they get there and they're not pressured watch the timeline of a short window that you usually had because of pressure i had a gentleman the other day tell me they're spot on with this because he said i learned this years ago and when somebody finally brought it to his attention is because there was so much of a push on food plots hanging tree stands on food plots it's food plot this food plot that food plot this and he, you know, he got into the food plot world. His, his, uh, you know, he started giving the deer nutrition, and two or three sits into it, his deer number started to drop. The next city went, the deer number started to drop. Next year, the next city went, and why is why is that? And he, as a client, told me without me, you know, sending him down that road, he told me his exact words were, "I learned very quickly." that I had to get the pressure off from my food plots and off these destination feed locations. Now, what I what I encourage you to do the, uh, today, tomorrow, this week, when you're on your way to town, especially if you're listening here from Michigan and uh, parts of these high high pressured states, on your way to town, count the, count the number of rifle blinds, count the number of blinds that you can see, tree stands even, that you can see ladder stands on the edge of fields between here and between your, your home and, and your uh, on your way to town it'll blow your mind. And if you start taking this into consideration about 
why you see summer deer out in these big ag fields and then why these deer aren't out in these fields is because crop changes corn leaves they don't have the security the the, the hunting the you know the the end of October, September October people start want to, wanting to try to promote their their success in hunting people start are in the woods pressure goes up pressure goes up deer sightings go down so there has to be a link between where that where that link is missing and that link is taking into consideration and making your put putting the emphasis on a labeling your food plots and your destination feed locations a sanctuary i i feel very strongly about that and i'll promote that until until uh, my last day in this business is once you you do that once you take the step and it's hard it's very hard it's it's e probably even harder for gentlemen that are watching or guys that are watching people that are watching these these videos to take the next step and not to hunt over a bait pile it's the it goes against everything you've ever been taught it goes against everything that you we've learned here in the state of Michigan growing up it goes against everything that your grand your father taught you your grandfather taught you but the 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 cycle needs to end and you're, so when you're, as soon as your that cycle ends, your success rates are going to go up. Your kids are going to you're going to benefit. Your kids are going to benefit, and you're finally going to see how this happens. Then, like I've always said, then if you get the opportunity to go to these uh, midwestern states where they can get away from it, and you don't implement that that change, you don't go into their their world and say, wait a minute, I shouldn't be on this food plot unless you know there's there's these daylight pictures. But even at that time, you have to make this decision. Even if you're in a situation where you do have a camera on the side of these food plots or your destination feed locations and these cameras are showing these deer are there, do not pull the, pull the trigger. You have to know. If you think that your sit is, is a success and these, you have a stand on the edge of these food plots in case something happens where you know that it's a, it's, it's a guarantee, but folks, there's no guarantee in, in deer hunting. and. There, what happens is, I see it time and time again, I see a week worth of daylight um, trail camera pictures. I know I can kill him. The stand's already there, slip in there, the buck doesn't show up, your food, your food plot, your destination feed location is full of deer, now guess what? Now you gotta get out. They get out, blow it, and they're, they're, they never tie, they never connect the uh, circle um, on, that, on that mature buck the rest of the season. And that is because you have, a, on a small parcel setting, in a high pressure state, you have to take into consideration you're not the only one in a 24 hour period that that deer, you know, within a month's time, within a 30 day window, you're not the only one that is, that is adding to the pressure. That's happening every time he goes on to the next farm, you're 20, he goes on to the next 40, he goes on to the next 20, you know, he goes on to the next 10 where there's four or five guys hunting. This pressure is a never ending vicious cycle. And that's why I put so much emphasis on these deals. So, in in, uh, in a re as a recap here, take take my consideration, put the emphasis on these this you know creating labeling your uh, food plots as your sanctuaries, treat them with the highest utmost respect. Go into those bedding areas where you usually have had those as a sanctuary, keep those as a sanctuary after they're created, after they're handled correctly, after they're maintained. Make sure they're not too thick. Make sure your line of travel is connected to your feed destination feed locations. On a small parcel, make sure you can stretch those out in a trail food plot system, whatever that is, to, to, to try to encompass that uh, line of travel as long as you can to keep those deer on that small parcel for this, as many minutes, as many hours as you can during huntable hours. But if that's not, if that, it's all linked together. If that sanctuary, the normal sanctuary that everybody speaks of as a bedding area isn't maintained, isn't set up correctly, and you're, you're, uh, then you're adding to the pressure of your food plot because that's not being looked at as a sanctuary, you're, you can have the best sanctuary in the world as far as bedding area, and if that does not connect, you're going to have, you're, uh, you're going to have wonderful, uh, after dark, uh, trail camera photos, and it does absolutely nothing to the success of your of your farm. So take those into consideration. Won't make it any more lengthy than it has to be, but I think you get the point. I think you can you feel the passion as far as making sure that going the extra mile and really digging deep and treating these. And, and, and folks, this is for, and I say this on a quarter acre, a half acre, an acre food plots, all the way up until you're, in, you know, on these uh, egg settings where you're looking over um, bean fields on 20 acres or 40 acres of corn.
same theory. You have to go the extra mile to make this happen. Once you see what it really does, once you see the power that it does, once you take yourself out of the the uh, the vicious circle that we speak of that happens on every 20 acres, every 40, every 80 that's jammed in next to each other here in high pressured states. Once you are not that in that vicious circle and you're not doing that and you're treating your food plots and your destination feed locations as your number one sanctuary, your number one hunting sanctuary, it's all uphill from there. So thanks guys for tuning in. If you've got any questions, uh, feel free to give me a show. Thanks.